Thank you very much. In the next 40 minutes, we will cover the history of this area called citizen science. We'll then see a little bit about the trends that really changed things in the past 10 years. And we'll see that they are both technical and social. And just looking at one of them doesn't give the full answer. We'll see what's going on today. And it's an amazing area. And you'll see the whole range of activity. And we'll finish with what we call extreme citizen science and running it here at UCL. So what is citizen science? One easy way to describe it is scientific activities in which non-professional scientists volunteer to participate in data collection, analysis, doing something with the result. And we are in the Darwin Lecture Theater, who was a citizen scientist. He wasn't employed by a university to carry out the work. He was actually a companion on the Beagle. And later on, he continued to be without actual academic position and carry out his work. Now, we know this era as the gentleman scientist, but then it had been extended to a wider range of people and communities. So the next point in our story, with a hint from Karen Cooper in the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, is William Wewell. He was in Trinity College in Cambridge, and he is the person who actually termed scientist as scientist. He created the word that we are using today to define these professional people who are employed through a university or other means now to do science. And one of the things that he's done is to try and understand the tides. So in order to understand the tides, he recruited thousands of people in 1835 to carry out a survey all across uh, the, the ocean. He had nine different places, thousands of people, involving people from seamen to uh, amateur interest and so on. And on this work, he actually received a medal from the Royal Society. Now, he called the people that helped him, the thousands of people who contributed the information and tabulated it and done things with it, subordinate laborer. And he was the, the metaphor that those people are like pearl collectors. They give him the different pearls, and then the scientist is the one who thread them into a proper necklace and make the sense of it, which is why he deserved the medal and they can go on with their life. Now, since then, once scientists became professional, citizen science continued. So, for example, for the over 100 years ago, there is the Christmas bird count, which just uh, finished uh, early in the beginning of the year, in which uh, hundreds of thousands of people in the United States going out and observing what they see in the gardens and then reporting back, and the Cornell of, of Ornithology is one of the places that concentrated. Or to this day, meteorological observations are done by volunteers, and there is a even a publication by the World Meteorological Organization dedicated to uh, volunteering in this area. And it continues in many other areas. So you can find it in archaeology, where people volunteer to help in excavation. You find it in astronomy. So the image at the bottom is from the Schumacher-Levy uh, comet, who got notoriety in 1994. Now, people don't know, but it's actually a collaboration between scientists, the shoemaker, and Levy, who was an amateur. He wasn't actually a professional scientist. And in this case, he kind of even was involved in creating a mission in NASA and so on. But what happened is that the citizens, the people who were involved, the volunteers themselves, received almost no recognition in most area or sometimes even hidden from view you would use their data, but you wouldn't say where it came from. And they were seen as untrusty contributors, so continuing on we will concept of things. But then things change, and the things that change over the past 10 years are the technological things. So we look at the web availability and the whole growth in internet access and broadband, which is important. Then there is this whole what we call Web 2.0, this whole interactive web and socially based knowledge creation systems that we see uh, around us today. 
And very importantly for citizen science, especially in cases where you do it in a specific location, the growth in location-based mobile devices. But that, and very importantly, we have to remember, combined with social trends, because that stuff wouldn't be enough. It increased level of education and increased understanding of abstract concept and scientific communication. So the first one is almost obvious. The internet grown from about 16 million users in 1995 to 2.5 billion people that have access to the internet today. But even more important is the access to broadband. The fact that now you can get information rich environment. You can see video, you can listen to audio sounds, you can interact in a very rapid way. So from the point of view of interacting with information, if it takes more than two seconds, you will feel that it's not interactive enough. You can do that because of all this access to broadband information. The second thing that was based on all this growth in broadband in other aspects is this socially, what I call socially uh, collaborative and socially based knowledge creation system. The most famous of those is Wikipedia, which uh, the moment it was open to everyone to start contributing, people started building it up and it's de facto the go-to encyclopedia. Regardless if people admit that they are doing that or not, they do use it quite a lot. And then we have things like Flickr, where people share photos, or a project that started at UCL, OpenStreetMap, of people now creating a collaborative map of the whole world for free and allowing people to access it and download the data. All these systems are based on interaction, social networking, and this broadband availability. But very importantly, another thing happened at the beginning of 2000. President Clinton uh, gave an instruction to remove what called the selective availability, this kind of military grade access to more accurate positioning. And suddenly all the GPS equipment became much more accurate. Instead of getting the location, if you are for civilian purposes, within 100 meters, you could get it within few meters. And that led to the first thing of what you see there, the satnavs and the explosion in them, but because there were more and more chips, the, the cost of them go down, and now many people who are sitting here are having a device in their pocket that got the ability to receive GPS signal and therefore to record the location according to the systems. So those are the technical aspects. Now let's look at the uh, social aspects. First thing is this amazing growth in tertiary education. This is the UK of adults age 25 plus, so remember that if you look through the graph, you're actually having the people that were born earlier on continue to live through it. And it rose from about 2% in 1950s to about now over 20% and approaching 25%. Every fifth person that you meet in the street had tertiary education. And if we're talking about a younger age group, we are approaching 40%. And also worldwide, the phenomena is even more astonishing. That's uh, information from the World Bank over the past 10 years. And the numbers there are in millions of students who are uh, currently in tertiary education. And as you can see from the graph on top, the line on top that shows you the population growth, so they are both in logarithmic scale, just to make it easier to compare them, the growth in the number of students is faster than the growth in the number of people. So we're moving uh, toward 2.5% of the total population of the world currently in tertiary education. But not just that, even for the wider population, we have this amazing thing called the Flynn effect after James Flynn who found it first, and you can find this book about it. And the Flynn effect is the fact that there is a gain of three points in IQ tests every 10 years over the 20th century. And the explanation of that is not that people are becoming smarter, because otherwise you have to say that the people at the beginning of the century 
were mentally retarded or something similar to that, which doesn't make a lot of sense. But what happened is that we are living in a much more abstract environment, and we're now having credit card instead of notes. We are trained with calculators and computers and other things, and you can see this progression of training the population to become what the IQ tests are testing. And therefore, you see the Flynn effect uh, happening. So all these things together really change the scene and enable a new and amazing era in citizen science. And this time, they are not being excluded because the Wikipedia and other things opened the door and showed that uh, people can participate in knowledge creation. It's now starting to be recognized and celebrated. So we have some new forms, which I'm using the term that Francois Gray uh, from uh, CERN and other places uh, define of citizen cyber science, the type of citizen science that is facilitated by uh, the internet. And we will see that there is a range of activities. So we'll, we'll look at biodiversity conservation monitoring. We'll look at what's called volunteer computing, volunteer thinking, DIY science, and community or civic science. So let's start with the biodiversity conservation. As we said, it's the longest one. That's why I've started with Darwin. Okay? It's been going on, and it will continue to go on. But it's been facilitated by website because now when you are going out and do observation of your garden in the UK phenology network, i.e. the changes of the seasons with flowers and leaves and other things, you can go to the website, Nature Calendar, and tag in your information. Or you can participate in a survey by the British Trust of Ornithology by just going to the website and adding the information. And a very recent report that was published just at the end of November last year counted over three, 230 projects in the UK. And one of the examples from UCL by Professor Kay Jones from the Department of Biology and also from ZSL is IBAT. So here's a demonstration of how ICT, information and communication technology, is changing this nature of this citizen science. So you take your iPhone, you download software, you take a special device that got microphone that can record BAT calls, and you can go around and do a survey and see exactly what it is. Now what do you do with the recording? Wait a minute and you'll see. The next thing that you can do, and also a fascinating project that's been running since 2007, coordinated by Imperial College, but UCL also participated in it, in the Department of Geography, is the Open Air Laboratory, OPAL, which again, just yesterday, celebrated the publication of a report uh, about their work in the House of Lords. And they allowed a lot of people to participate in different projects and in different activity and explore how they can contribute from uh, monitoring water to many other projects. So this area that is the kind of the bedrock of citizen science and was there always with people observing their gardens and watching birds and doing all other things is still there. It's just benefiting immensely from uh, all the abilities of computers and the internet. The next type is a type of citizen cyber science, and that's called volunteer computing. We have too much processing power on our computer, and we can do things um, very fast, so, so we have extra spare capacity within the computer. Now, what do you do with that? You can search for extraterrestrial intelligence, for example. This project started in 1999, allow you to download the software that run the processing, the extra capacity of your computer and use it in order to analyze a lot of data. And it's the biggest computing project at the moment, bigger than many other projects, even the most recent one that you hear about processing data in, uh, from CERN and from other places. Or another interesting application is Quake Catcher, where you take an additional device and connect it to your computer which can sense vibration. And then the software run in the background, and in the case that there is an earthquake or a tremor, you can get the information and it will be sent to the server, and that combined with 
other information, other seismic information can help in improving the understanding of earthquake and other aspects, and it's been used already in some places in the world. The next type is volunteer thinking. Volunteer thinking, even volunteer computing, you just download something, put it on your computer and forget it, apart from looking at lovely uh, screensaver from time to time. In volunteer thinking, you actually engage with the process. You are using your ability to look at information, and for example, we humans are much better at looking at images and classifying what we are seeing in the image than the best computers or the best algorithms that currently exist for computers. So the first project in this range of classifying things, and one of the most famous projects in this area is Galaxy Zoo, where images from the Hubble telescope were used to uh, uh, classify different types of galaxies through a structured process. The people behind it, which uh, include Chris Lintot from Oxford University, created a project called Zooniverse where they are using the same principle and lessons that they learned from engaging very large number of people in this classification process to many other things. And coming back to Kay Jones, BATS project, the recording that are coming in can be classified by volunteers. So if you would like to listen to BATS and help in analyzing uh, the information that was collected through different survey, go to BAT Detective and you can do the work. But just to show that the range of activities of citizen science is going way beyond what you would just describe as, as strictly scientific and kind of low level analysis, we got here at UCL to inscribe Bentham, where there is all the writing of Jeremy Bentham, and they are fairly difficult to read. It's quite a lot of work. So to inscribe Bentham encouraged uh, many people to join in and use this software to uh, record the information, and they managed to work very well and solve many of the transcript, which if you were just waiting for the occasional student who is interested in Bentham and willing to transcribe some things, it would take a very long time. Another type of citizen science is what we would call the do-it-yourself science. So the, the one example of it, again from UCL, there is this activity that undergraduate students involve in synthetic biology through a competition called the International genetically engineered machine, or iGEM for short. And last year, the students from UCL carried out work together with enthusiasts who are just interested in doing things with biology, it's sometimes called biohacking, and involved them in the process of doing activities in synthetic biology. So that's quite in the cutting edge of where scientific activity is happening. And another group that is doing interesting things is the public laboratory of open technology and science, where they are creating, as you can see there, techniques for very cheap mapping, uh, using spectrometry, and other techniques. We also done some work here at UCL around, and that's now to our group, working with communities around uh, Deptford in London on issues of uh, air pollution. So using white samples where you can just take a, a sample of the dust in, in your area and then you can analyze to see what's going on in it. And also there is another project that's been going on for a while, Global Community Monitor, that helps communities to take some uh, bags to extract some air next to petrochemical plants and then to analyze to see what they are breathing. And they can be involved in different type of activity. The reason that it's called community and civic science is that a lot of time it's connected to issues of environmental justice or concern about the livelihood of specific community. So what we have seen within this range of activities, we've seen a whole range, the range of activities that now fall under the category of uh, citizen science. But the issue with that is that if we think about the scientific process, so you have the problem definition, deciding that you want to classify galaxies or you want to analyze bats call. Then there is the data collection. 
the activity of collecting the data. There is the analysis, either basic or more advanced, and then the write-up and publication of the result and doing things with it. And lots of time when you look at citizen science projects, you see that they are limited, and most of them are either in the data collection, a lot of the biodiversity conservation project that I showed you out of this uh, 230 project that I talked about, many of them are in the data collection while a lot of the volunteer thinking are also on the basic analysis. People are not involved in wider things, although there are forums and some people, for few of them, they are doing above it, but by and large, the project are designed to, to do basic analysis. And in terms of levels of education, you can also see uh, interesting changes. So, as you would expect in Transcribe Bentham, as a result of this changes in education, they've done a survey, and I think, if I'm not wrong, they found 25% of the people that are involved in it got a PhD. Okay. And they do different things in, in their spare time, whereas in IGEM you also look at the people and you discover that it's people with postgraduate degree, and as you go down the scale, there is less and less things for people to be involved in. And those two things also lead to a different geographical pattern of the distribution of where things happen. So if you look, those, those are the images from a large hydron collider at home, one of the volunteer computing projects where you download the software and let it run, and you can see the concentration in Europe and the United States and the fact that in Africa you don't see almost no volunteer, and in other places you see very few. Now, those kind of aspects of citizen science, and they're great. There are, as we've seen from the social changes, there are plenty of people to go around <laughs> uh, because some people are concerned that they will run out of volunteer. And I did hear it in some cases. But in terms of what we are experiencing in the world, and that's uh, an image that I took from uh, John Paddington about the things that we are, uh, will have a challenge within the a period until 2030, we do need to do something and we can get into more important uh, areas. And where we need to deal with challenges of energy, food, water, climate change, biodiversity and other things, we also have to remember that while we are, and that's the same information that I showed you in the graph about education, so here you see the mean years in school, and you can uh, in, uh, see at the bottom the income. But what you can see is that the rich countries, yeah, we don't have a problem. There are plenty of people that can be involved in citizen science, and the experience show that there are some super uh, volunteer who can collect a lot of data and help with the analysis. But as we go down the scale, there are more problems. And that gets even worse when we're talking about women. And we need to think about who will need the help with, and who can get the most out of it. Which is why, as a result of this thing, we came up with the idea of extreme citizen science. So if we have the regular citizen science, where the users are usually educated, some connection to the domain because they are interested or other things, in the extreme citizen science, we want to open it to everyone, we want to get into anyone, regardless of their level of literacy. Also, the locations, because the geography of it, as you've seen, because of the type of people that are involved, you are concentrated into places that are either popular, places where the wealthy people would like to go and have a holiday, or the places where they live. That's the places where they can do the work. But if we make it available to everyone in the first go, we might be able to go to everywhere. Also, the role is very important, and we want to get into a situation where we, we extend it. We'll go to the extreme of where it's done now. So if people are involved in data collection, let's stretch them to be involved in the problem definition. So we want them to be involved in all the process, but the point is that it requires a different way of approaching the whole issue. So if in the first mode you are thinking about it as involving the public, to the task that you want in structuring what they are doing in system like Transcribe, Bentham, or Zooniverse, and other things, the type that we're talking about require you to actually work very close to people, do it in a collaborative, and that does mean that the scale of it won't be 
by itself go to a hundred of thousands of people. And another way of looking at it is to think about the level of engagement and participation. So at the bottom of the scale, when someone just installs something and go around and doing that, they are just acting as a sensor. You don't trust them. You just believe what the instrument that they are carrying around is doing. Whereas uh, as you go up, you, you start engaging people in a bigger level, and you end up with collaborative science, which is problem solving, doing everything together. So that's what we're trying to do at UCL, establishing and, and, and running, and we've already been running for a year and a bit, a extreme citizen science group that works on uh, the theory, technique, methodology, and other aspects that will allow any community, regardless of its literacy, to start bottom-up citizen science activity, collect, analyze, and do all the work that involve in it. And if trying to sum up what it's all about, then there are sort of four principles. First of all, that the problem can be bottom-up. It can come from the people who are involved in the area. They want to improve the, um, the uh, agriculture or anything else. We want to support engagement through the scientific process, as I said, from start to end. We want an inclusive engagement where you deliberately target people that are usually excluded from it, and you'll go to places that are usually excluded from the process. And not everything will hit all these four things. It's more of a vision or ideals, but you can see other examples. And here an example of how far you can reach, and that's from the work of Bo Lotto uh, at UCL in neuroscience, who together with a bunch of eight to 10 years old created a scientific paper. They came up with a research question, which is uh, uh, understand if bumblebees could learn to recognize different spatial configuration of color. They carried out the research, they wrote the paper. It was quite a fight to get the paper published, but in the end, it was published in biology letters. So let's see uh, things that we're doing to finish off. Um, here's one example, noise mapping work, and this is a group of residents that live next to London City Airport, and they were concerned about the expansion of the airport and what's going on. So together with them in 2007, 8, later on in 2010, we develop a method that will suit them in terms of noise mapping. So having forms and recording the information and then being able to do it by themselves. And they then carried it out and collected the information on a website where each red dot that you see is a one location where people recorded the level of noise. Not just that, when you have people on the ground recording and you let them the space to start adding more information, they can add pictures, they can add reports about stacks, they can add about events or specific things that they've seen and experienced, and then you can be very, very lucky. And we were lucky because the one stage where the community was running the activity, it was when there was the ash cloud over Europe in April 2010. And that allowed them to carry out the analysis and collect the data at the same time with the same instrument and the same protocol and same approach when there are no flights and when there are flights. And then things, for example, like the local traffic come to the fore, which usually in models and other things don't come. Later on, within a project called Every Aware, which is still running, and you can download the software uh, that I'm talking about uh, from the website called uh, Every Aware, which is there, we develop a software that runs on your smartphone. So you download it, and then you can record noise level in your environment and see what it is. And with a bit of help from uh, another grant from UCL, we were able to also run an advertisement campaign around Heathrow. So doing the, with this advan and having information on the website and a few other places and encouraging people to download and use the website. And you can see that it actually was quite impressive. So if in June 2012, last year, we had very few uh, images, uh, very few data points. By July, people were starting to add information even more in August, 
And by October, we have a very rich information. Today, we have over uh, 5,000 recordings from the whole area, which make it one of the most dense noise recording project by a community anywhere in the world. Another example of this uh, extreme citizen science is in forest monitoring. So this is the Congo Basin where my co-director of the extreme citizen science group, Jerome Lewis, uh, is working with pygmy hunter-gatherer groups there. And you can see him there working with them on identifying resources that belong to them in order to protect them as part of a forestry management plan. But it's difficult, and it's difficult to read the maps and understand and to deal with that. So over the past uh, five to six years, he developed this, uh, first of all, approach that you can use a handle device that allow you to use pictogram and record the information. And the issue was that it needed also a GPS receiver, but that allowed them to uh, identify and protect some valuable resources, such as tree where there are certain caterpillars that are uh, valuable for the community. And later on, the same software was used to uh, monitor illegal logging in the area. The issue is that those projects were coming from the outside. And the community got a problem with eco-guards, people that are there to protect about illegal poaching, but instead of just dealing with uh, poachers, they also deal with the uh, pygmies and start blaming them at the process. So they've asked Jerome if he can develop a tool for them where they can record the problem. So here's an example of the problem definition. And we wanted to develop for them a tool that will allow them to uh, record the information, go around, uh, capture information, take images, and do other things. And there are issues of literacy, of uh, the signal of GPS, electricity, network coverage. And what we have done is developed for them a software. And the nice thing is that today it's possible to develop this software very rapidly and to provide, for example, this is the recording of a camp. And by April last year, we also were able to do that. So instead of having two heavy devices, it's now possible to do it on a smartphone that uh, got the adapted software and allowed them to use it in different applications. And they took it into the forest and analyzed the information and checked that it's working well for them. So that was the first prototype. And when we came back to the office and checked it with imagery that we received from the Jane Goodall Institute, we could see that the recording works quite well and allow us to continue and progress it. And as I mentioned, we also have the problem of electricity. So uh, through work within the group, we also discovered that there is things like that, a port that allow you to charge your phone. And that's suitable for the community because you can't use solar power because there is no, not enough uh, sun because of the canopies. So if you have interesting problems, you'll have interesting solution. That's usually what's going on within this group. So here's an example of the prototype, and we continue to develop this prototype uh, with an aim that uh, by the summer, they will be able to start doing the uh, illegal poaching monitoring within the community. And there is already plans in place to also engage community in more recording of uh, local resources and other types of information within uh, these areas. So those are just uh, early examples, and there are many more examples of what we mean by extreme citizen science. And you can find them on our website or on the blog, or you can follow us on Twitter if you are interested. And that's about it. So I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Miki. We, we do have time for questions. If you do have a question, if you could wait for a microphone um, so that people watching online can hear you. Um, first one's just up the top here. Um, but since you already have experience running projects in very different settings, I imagine 
one of the challenges of uh, running these projects are the social dynamics that are involved in uh, achieving a particular goal. Um, group structure, uh, motivations to participate, uh, interactions between team members, and so on. What, what have you learned about those kinds of dynamics? Um, it's... We don't have enough time to cover <laughs> that kind of things. It's a topic for a completely different discussion. You can find some information on that. We produce a report in every aware because we should report on the motivation and engagement. And we actually, just earlier today, we talked about this topic inside the group, and it's one thing that we're working on. So you can find some information on the Mapping for Change website, which is the social enterprise that we run on the side, which explain some of the issues of guidelines of how you engage people. But we're also doing things uh, inside the group. And you can find few blog posts on the blog, but it's, it's an ongoing uh, area of, of work, and we, we can give, I can give you other sorts of information if you leave me. Thanks. Yes. Hi there. Um, Jack Stilgo from the Department of Science and Technology Studies here. Um, I'm just wondering, I can see how all of the things that you're describing um, change the, uh, the, the science that's, that's done. I'm interested in whether it changes the scientists that do it. So I wonder if you can offer either personal reflections or, or the, uh, some sense of how your colleagues have changed going through this process. Yeah. I, I completely agree. That's why when, when I'm talking about the uh, presentation, it's, uh, the, the process itself, I'm always highlighting that when you're getting into the more extreme citizens, I won't try to get into the right slide, saying that you can work on crowdsourcing, that allows you to stay within the safe scientific, I'm the professional, they are the kind of pearl collectors as in we will. That's why I like this example, because it's so good about the differentiation between the scientist and the subordinate laborer. If you're going into the more engaged side of things, you don't have a choice but to say, I don't know more than you about your environment. I might know some things about my specific areas. And we've seen an example that surprised me to a very large extent. So the first community where we've done the noise mapping, it was the community members who went into the WHO website and show noise regulations and talk about the structure of the noise and mention the psychoacoustic aspects and done all this thing and presented it to the community all by themselves. We didn't need to do any of this work. That's actually why Wikipedia and all these open resources are so important when we are getting into this area and kind of providing the backbone for it. So you kind of need to approach this project very differently, and it doesn't work the same way that, that you'll approach the other projects. So it needs to be much more collaborative and participatory approach to the whole process. Thank you very much. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for, for questions. But I want to thank you all for coming. Thank you for your questions. And thanks especially to Professor Muki Hakle.